Well, I'd like to welcome you all here today on uh, what I call Segway Selling. And the person who originally set up the class, uh, Fran Tabor, which by the way, she has books for sale. I can only say one thing about these books. Um, when I first started working at Avon Vacuum and Sewing 15 years ago, I knew nothing about cleaning supplies. Um, do any of you guys carry cleaning supplies? Do any of you guys own a retail outlet? People come in to buy stuff. Do any of you work at a retail outlet? I think I'm getting everybody now. Do any of you work at a retail outlet where people come in to buy stuff? Great, okay, I got you all now. Well, the amazing thing about a retail outlet, it's one of those interesting things. Um, sometimes we forget what it is that we do. And there's a statement that I've learned from a gentleman called Norm Nutt. He uh, owns a Bernina, the Bernina Nettle Sewing Center. It's, he's no longer owning it now. But the one thing he taught me that's imperative, and by the way, in that Bernina Sewing Center in Salt Lake, uh, Utah, they sold more Bernina sewing machines than they did in Switzerland or in Europe in the world. They were the largest Bernina dealership in the world. So for me, it was really awesome to work for him and learn some things about how to run a business. And this is what he told me. He said this, if you're doing business today, the way you were doing it yesterday, you will not be in business tomorrow. And I try to think about that, and I try to be innovative. You know, uh, Dean at the keynote uh, address yesterday was saying that it's imperative that you reinvent yourself, right? You keep going forward. I want to let you know something. What do cleaning supplies, and by the way, I have no affiliation with any cleaning company at all. I'm not going to push anything on you. But what cleaning, what, what do clean supplies and vacuums have in common? Yeah. Isn't that it? One big difference is this. To a customer that you sell a high quality vacuum to, how often are you going to see them? That's an issue, isn't it? They do need to buy a bag or a belt. In the, in the retail outlet, they have something called the itch cycle. Uh, the buying cycle. And what they determine in that buying cycle is how often the person is going to need that product and what they're going to need for that product. If it's a vacuum, they need bags and they need belts, correct? Pretty straightforward. And when we look at our stores and we look at customers coming in our stores, you know, it would be great to have you know, as many people buying vacuums as bags and belts buying back new vacuums every day. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even have to be here to be so busy, wouldn't we? Because for me, those numbers are, out of 80 customers we get in a day, maybe one to two, if we're lucky, are saying, hey, I'm looking for a new vacuum. It's, it's very rare. Um, part of that has to do with the stigmatism that small specialty shops have, right? When they're going to the big box stores, everything's on sale. And they're so thrilled about it, there's even a happy smiley face. They were lose, we're going to sell it for less than everybody else and lose money. I don't know about you, but that doesn't put a smile on my face. That puts me out of business. <laughs> so uh, the bottom line is, is this, and I'll try not to use the bottom line too many times, but it just means I'm getting back to the point. <laughs> it's just to let you understand my conversation. But the point here is this. Um, if we could turn more of those bag and belt cells, little insignificant items into the next step up. And when I was in Las Vegas a long time ago, and we only had five or six customers in a day when we first were getting the store going, we had to capitalize on every sale. So me and my brother had this little game on who could make the most money out of each customer. Now, little did I know that, have you guys ever heard of Walgreens? Believe it or not, there is a book written that says from from good to great. And the bottom line is what they do is all this analysis of businesses. And what businesses have the greatest and strongest staying power that they're growing? You know, not the quick start uh, computer companies, whatever, they're here today and gone tomorrow because technology is fleeting and changing. Remember what I said to begin with? If you're not changing, you're going to be left behind. Well, the bottom line with Walgreen is that they were innovative. They used to be a restaurant and a store. 
what they realized really quick is even though they were going to lose revenue by eliminating the restaurant, if they increased the store and they have this certain amount of captive audience with pharmaceuticals being so popular, if you don't believe they are, again, watch TV and find out why you shouldn't take half the stuff that they're recommending if you read, oh, the side effect may cause death, <laughs> you know. Uh, but the bottom line is pharmaceuticals are huge, multi-billion dollar company. So here you have all these people coming in for their prescriptions, and oh, by the way, there's water, there's milk. I mean, they're huge. But this is what made Walgreens very, very, very successful in the amount of years that they've been in business, which is they've been around forever, really. But the bottom line is, is this, is they count each customer how many add-on sales that they do. Because again, what's the percentage that you're going to have on a vacuum cleaner? I don't care whether you spent they sold the vacuum for $1,000 and you had a $1,000 day? Not really. First, you had to buy that vacuum and almost consume it 50%, so it's 500 bucks for that $1,000 vacuum cleaner. And did they give that money to you for free or did you have to, are you borrowing on it through something called bank loans and percentages? So the bottom line is you really have to understand your underlying profit. And when you look at those, those specific things, what we're looking at is you realize, yeah, I sold a thousand dollar back and they had five. Well, the bottom line is, is you had one customer that came in and bought one vacuum that one day, and you had 70, 50 customers. What did they buy? So, if I sell a package of bags, what's my what's my margin on that? Isn't it 200 percent prep on some of the things on belts? 300 percent. So you need to be aware of the little incidentals. But when I talk about the chemicals and cleaning supplies. And for those of you that aren't carrying them, it's part of your business. And it takes a demonstration to sell it. And there are proprietary cleaning supplies that they can't get at Walmart, Kmart, Shopko, and Costco. But then I'll ask you a question. When they're at Walmart, Kmart, and Costco, aren't they there more often buying cleaning supplies? Than, well, I won't say vacuums there, but in our stores it's vacuums. Because when you're selling disposable vacuums, they're, you know, they're not going to last as long. But my point is, is this, the key with Segway selling is having incidentals that you're making three and four and 500% margins on. So your, your, the amount of money that you're having to put out to become a cleaning store, which that's what a vacuum is, isn't that a natural Segway? Isn't that part of what we're doing and selling? And the cool thing is, is we're already talking about cleaning carpets. You think it's possible that somebody who's spending a thousand dollar vacuum cleaner might have a stain on their carpet too. Isn't it a natural segue? I, I'm not in their way. I'm I do the natural flow that I was discussing earlier. Is it out of? Am I being pushy by mentioning? By the way, how do you take care of your carpet stains? And one of two interesting things are going to happen. You ready for this? They might have a shampoo. Or they might not. So it could be a, it could be an actual shampoo or sale on top of the vacuum sale. How many would like to add three hundred and fifty or four hundred dollars? I mean, we carry Royal shampoos. I'm just throwing that I'm just throwing that brand out because it's a pretty decent vacuum cleaner. They haven't screwed up yet, even though it is made in China, and you never know. <laughs> the The bottom line is is that uh, the margin that we make on that is I'm able to double. But again, you allow the process, the selling process, to dictate where the customer is going to lead you and you allow the customer to take you where they're going to lead you, not willy-nilly, but by asking them specific questions. So I could say, I could do the whole vacuum demo and have the vacuum sold, and then I could ask them the question, oh, by the way, would you like to buy a shampooer? That's not as impressive as, I need to, I need to ask the question that's behind, that the customer's going to relate to, that's specifically theirs, how are you, Taking care of your car. Do you have problems with stains on your carpet? Who, do, who in here does not have stain problems with stains on their carpet? Or has never had a stain on their carpet? Raise their hand. You've never? Ah, Mr. Clean, I'm impressed. Well, the bottom line, Mr. Hughes, no, I'm teasing. Uh, the bottom line here is this. Uh, that's such a simple question. We know what the response is going to be. And that's why I try never to ask a question that I can't control the answer to. This goes, back to my, this goes back to my confidence. My whole, the three C's of selling, um, confidence, confidence, confidence. Um, and just to that in 10 seconds, uh, in order for a sale to take place, for those of you who didn't make it to yesterday's uh, seminar, in order for a sale to take place, we all assume what we know what that means. 
but I've, I've basically in the process of setting up a simple system that anybody who's never sold can understand what selling is. Because we make the assumption because we're doing selling all day that we really know what it is. And I'm letting you know <clears throat> the most important thing you can learn in selling are the sales you miss, the ones you don't get. Because then you have to reanalyze, make corrections, how can I improve? When everyone's just coming in and buying, ah, I'm a great salesman. Or, you know, there's a fine line between salesmen and order takers sometimes, because when we get kind of lazy. So uh, getting back to uh, the selling process itself, the three C's, in order for a sale to take place, one of three requirements have to be met. Any one of these three requirements will end in a sale. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Three things, three sales. How many have read Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, all these books on sales? There's a ton of them. Thick, thick, thick. I'm talking three principles that you can teach your staff and your salespeople and yourself. And with these three points that I'm sharing with you, you can also analyze your selling process. You can improve. You can make the adjustments that I'm talking about. Why did I get the sell? What principle of these three C's created that sell? How did I lose the sell? Which, how can I narrow it down? How can we make corrections if we don't understand the process or what we did right or wrong? And when you can make your own self-corrections, now we're moving forward. Okay, so the first C is in order for a sale to take place is this. The customer has to have confidence in the business. And now these three C's are two-sided, they're like a coin. So here we have the business. How many of you have ever seen a penny? What's on the back of that penny? Is it not a building? Just to help, just to help you remember this. It is a building. So that's the business. So in your mind, imagine the building. So the first C is that side of the penny. What's on the other side? Good old Abe, right? That's right. That's the salesperson. So the first C is the, in order for a sale to take place, the customer need only have confidence in the business or the salesperson. Pretty simple, isn't it? Aren't I amazing? <laughs> I figured that out on my own. It, this is stuff we all know. Secondly, in order for a sale to take place, the second C is this, and the C stands for confidence, of course, is we could, we could use the coin again if you want, but, but it is strictly a coin. On one side of the coin, we have the manufacturer of the product. How many people come in and say, I want to buy a Hoover? Right? They're sold on that brand name, aren't they? Absolutely. Now on the other side of that coin, now we have a specific model, right? I want the lightweight Hoover. I want the self-propelled Hoover, you know, and, and that's what I'm talking about. So the second C, the reason people will buy, is because of the manufacturer or the product. How many of you can remember that? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? What now the C? C stands for confidence in all of these. That's why I call it the three Cs. Confidence, confidence, confidence. Yeah. So if it's confidence in the, in the manufacturer, confidence in the product. Make sense? And now the third C, which is the most important, even though it's last, it is the most important. In order for a customer to make that decision to buy, they have to have confidence in themselves. And, or, remember the other side of the coin? Their expert. What's their expert? It could be the Consumer Report. It could be, oh, I believe back in clean and it properly. Now, that was more of an oddly sounding Dyson, but that's the idea. <laughs> um, that's really it. And when we talk about the third C, and I've talked about all these other C's, any one of these C's will create a sale. Because if customers come in and they've got their confidence in the Consumer Report, some people bring it in like a Bible. You know, they really do. Well, the consumer report's safe, you know, and about this vacuum. Do you know how I take care of the consumer report? With honesty and truthfulness. How many here have heard of the vacuum cleaner Kenmore? Have you ever heard of it? What are you going to notice on the consumer report in Kenmore? A miraculous coincidence. This miraculous coincidence that I discovered is that if you go back to the last 20 years, you're going to find Kenmore in the top three or four. Man, they get things right, don't they? 
you. They really do. That's just, I, I'm one of those people that I just believe everything I read and see. How about you? Yeah, exactly. And when you ask the customer just exactly like that, you believe everything you read or see, and guess what? They become a little skeptical, but we still have to unhinge their expert and replace it with who? Number one, right? Unless their expert agrees with me. So, yeah, they, yeah, of course. Your mother uses this? Oh, of course. I, boy, she's, who am I to dispute that? Why, why make more work for yourself, right? Can you repeat that about the Tim Martin consumer? Everything that I'm saying, you're going to find on Facebook. And you're gonna, this is being recorded right now. So if you have any questions, you can book up. I'm not going to sell you anything. It's just a Facebook page. It allows you to review the demonstrations that I'm doing on video, a keynote address that I did uh, a couple years back, uh, tons of videos on real live demonstrations for vacuums and sewing machines, because that's my background. And if you wanted something repaired, I could probably work something out like that. Uh, there will be things that we'll be selling to you later on, but to start off with, it's all going to be free. I'm just testing this out to see if there's an interest for it. Um, I've never done the Facebook thing before, so it's new for me, but it's just my name. You hook up, and I'm also linking it to YouTube. Uh, my son knows how to do all that stuff. I, I just let him do it. <laughs> I'm that kind of nice guy. So getting back to my point on that third C, um, the bottom line is this. What I want to be able to do is replace their experts. So when we talk about the consumer report and just saying for whatever it is and all the other reports that copy it, um, I remember working for Mealy, so I can say this even on video, and we had all the paraphernalia for the Mealy Buyer's Choice, Best Buy, etc. Maybe you guys seen those posters. It's not the Consumer Report, but it's another. And he gives me a call. Hey, you need to take down all the Mealy paraphernalia. So I go, okay, come on, guys. We're going to put it all down. And then I get a call a week later. He says, hey, you didn't throw away the paraphernalia did for Mealy. And this is the previous years, correct? I go, well, no, we still got it floating around. You can put it back up. We paid for another year. What would you call that? I call it advertising, wouldn't you? If you're paying to have your product tested and to get a positive review, because I could only imagine if, uh, if you didn't get a good review, you're not gonna pay, right? <laughs> so those are the things I share with my customer to help them understand my perspective. Now, I hadn't finished with the consumer report quite yet. I was mentioning that you're gonna find Sears in the top three or four for the past 20 years. What amazing coincidence. You also find Hoover right next to it always. But how many of you know, and I'm sure most of you know, that Kenmore doesn't make Kenmore vacuums? They stick their name on it. Who makes them? Anybody? Panasonic. Absolutely, Panasonic. Thank you. Panasonic makes it. Now let's go to that same supposedly balanced and fair consumer report, and let's take a look Eight, eight or nine little circles down with the lower rating where the Panasonic is at. And then ask ourselves this question, hmm, what the heck? And the one thing I know about Kenmore, they have purchasers throughout the world, and when they go to you, it's about, we want half a million units, and we're gonna pay X amount of dollars for it, because we're having these for you, and Panasonic's gonna say, sure, whatever you wanna pay. What they pay, you think it's going to determine the value and quality of that component? And if you're Panasonic, wouldn't Sears be somewhat of a competitor to your brand? Are you going to put the same quality and the identical design into a Kenmore that you are your own? Number one, Kenmore couldn't afford to have the same quality. But that's my point. So my bigger question is, and you just let the question ask, you, you never make a statement. You ask a question. I've just, this is what I found curious. When you make a statement, do you realize you're arguing? Um, there's a whole nother level of fun stuff we can play with, but that's a whole nother discussion about that. Um, but that's, that's my point. If you don't argue with your customer, there's none of the pressure. I believe this is the best vacuum. The thing that we're tempted with them when they come in and say, what do you think of Dyson or a Kirby? I believe it becomes an egotistical thing. With me, I've got all those vacuums in the store. Well, well tell me what you think. That's what's important. You know, if we could 
If we only had to sell one vacuum cleaner, our store would be a lot smaller. These are statements that I make that eliminate arguing and eliminate the customer trying to elicit from me a statement. Not being wishy-washy and not being political, but customers aren't always being 100% honest with you or straight with you, or they just don't know or care. They just saw a Dyson commercial, their wife sent them down to buy a Dyson, and they wanted to know your opinion on it because they bought bags and bouts from you. They're actually on their way to Target because they're on sale there for 10% off, but they know at Target, are they going to get any informed information from them? No, so we'll stop by from you first and get the free information, good, bad, and different. You know, it's that simple. I, I, I mean, I, my ego is not so big to believe that if someone walks in the door, oh, hi, you've heard of me, haven't you seen my Facebook page? You know? <laughs> no, it, that's not what it's about. It's all about them. It's all about their needs and how you can help them get what they need and even more. And that's what Segway Selling is about that I'm going to get into here pretty quick. So uh, the key thing here is when they're coming in that door, we just, we just have to be careful that our, our heads aren't so big. And even if it's somebody you know and, you, and they bought the high-end vacuum from you, they, they're still, they still watch TV. What do you think of the Dysons? Don't make the mistake of saying it's terrible. Uh, what you need to do is say, here it is. Let's go check it out. Hey, because guess what? If they're, what Dyson did is spend $60 million to get somebody interested in buying a new product. What an awesome company. Same thing with Oric. They're getting, I mean, they, they step, I mean, Dyson alone jumped the retail sales of vacuum cleaners from the box stores up two or 300 bucks into margins that we can now make a comfortable living. I'm not saying selling that particular product because uh, I would be out of business at 20% margin. I don't know about the rest of you, but we've got some overhead. So the key thing is, how do we take that product, not say anything derogatory, but let it be what it is. Let the customer make the choice and decision. We just set up a demonstration that shows it. And my demonstrations, again, are simple. That three little principles seems to go all through everything that I say and do. Agitator, motor, filtration system. Well, the way that you determine the difference between one vacuum and another is we simply compare the components. Doesn't that make sense? Let's look at this brush roll, because from the repair, uh, on all the vacuum cleaners that all of you get in today, what percentage of those vacuum cleaners having issues with the brush roll, if it's a box store vacuum. About 100%, isn't it? How many have seen a melted down brush roll by show of hand? Yeah, I have them all over my floor too, I wonder why. <laughs> you know, did you show people? Seeing is believing. And that's one of the things I really, really teach is that you want to make sure you never say something you can show. But when we're sitting back in the afternoon and we haven't eaten lunch yet and here that customer comes in and we just, they just a bag or a belt customer, where they go, oh gosh, okay, yeah, here's your bag. No, they're, they're a potential you know, high-end vacuum cell if you, know, if you want to take the, put the other extra effort and work into it. And it doesn't take much, just a simple question. And what we did yesterday, and this will take a second, when they come up for that bag of bell, all I simply say is, would you like, how many would you like? And I'll show three. The reason why I show, I show multiple belts, I didn't go into all the psychology of it yesterday, but if they are having problems with that vacuum, are they going to want to buy more than one and maybe state it? And you were saying very, very well, well, what if through my process somebody says, hey, I hate my vacuum? Oh, really? Well, had you, had you considered something different or better? Or more importantly, what do you got? <laughs> maybe they have your high-end vacuum and they hate it. Are you going to be offended by it? I'm not. You want to know why? Because I'm not the one that sold them the vacuum. They're the ones that bought it. Do you understand the difference? I'll tell you how you can tell the difference when your customer comes in with buyer's remorse to complain. He's the one. She's the one. You know, that's how you can tell. When they point you out and say, you're the one that sold them the vacuum and you told them blah, 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 guess what? They didn't buy the vacuum. You did. And even if you're the best salesperson in the world and you did everything perfect, there are people out there that are just downright, you know, not vacuum literate. <laughs> I mean, they do crazy things. I, I was mentioning yesterday that I had to quit telling people the water inch lift motor, that this is a 110 inch water lift motor or 120 inch water lift motor. That's back when suction and all that. I'm the one to airflow now. And that's what the gauges that I have does, by the way, that we're going to be seeing here at the end of the show. I'll let you see the full demonstration on this. It's actually quite impressive. Um, and it makes it simple because it eliminates me. You know, uh, there's another guy, another guy in this industry called Joe Strange. 
This guy sold Kirby, still has a Kirby distributor today, has 10 stores. He's in the South, amazing, amazing guy. And what he told me this, he said, the biggest problem with, with salespeople is that they cannot get out of the cell. They, cannot, they, can't, they, they destroy more cells than they make by getting it because as soon as the customer gets excited about it, like, yeah, that's, yeah, they want to take the credit for the sell instead of just allowing the demonstration to sell it for you. How many people you, how many people of you could have better salespeople if all they had to do was a simple demonstration at the end of it, the customer says, yeah, I'll take one or two or three. Isn't that the ultimate situation that we can be in as business owners? Isn't that where we want to be? So that we have a simple demonstration, this is how you do it. Go into an Apple store, I know they keep mentioning it, but everything that they do, it's going to be very specific. Every setup is going to be the same. Um, I'm not trying to say you have to train, you have to remove the personalities from your salespeople. Um, with the three C's of selling, it's all open. There's a million different ways to say what I said. You know, and in fact, my favorite, my favorite sales statement when I can't think of anything else to say is really simple. It's a one word, two syllable, or two letters. It's called O. I go, oh, and you can make O positive, oh, and you can make it, oh, but that O oh elicits a response from your customer, and it makes them, oh, like you're thinking, and all my salespeople are able to remember it, you know? I can say, well, would you like that, and would you like that, but those are going to be cash or charge. Those are closing questions, and at the end of every closing question, you're supposed to be quiet, and I can teach them all those basics, but ultimately, if you're really trying to elicit information from that customer, and like, for instance, I was talking yesterday again, and since you all haven't seen it, I'll just cover it really quickly. The whole idea behind my bag and belt thing is that you know what the margin is on a bag or a belt. It's pretty good. But don't you even make more money on a repair? This is the segue thing I'm talking about. And don't we make even any more on a new vacuum cell? Maybe. Depends what the vacuum is, but most of the times, yes. So ultimately, we let the customer decide what, how far they want to invest through a series of simple questions. And I have it written on the tail, <laughs> number one. <laughs> uh, after the, number, the critical thing is, is that you take the customer for exactly what they asked for, and you take them nowhere else. You don't try to, you don't have a vacuum cleaner plugged in that's gonna be turned on and pushed in front of them. I don't do any of that. I don't need to, because I'm willing to take my time and make that customer feel comfortable and confident in coming into my store that stuff isn't going to be smashed into their face. It's that simple. I'm not going to push anything on them. They're going to feel like they're driving the car. You know, they're, going to, they're driving the whole selling process. And you know what? They are, but they're doing it through my guidance. You know, I'm like Siri. You know, those, the, the, the guidance systems, take a left here, take a right, hopefully an accurate one. <laughs> But that's, that's really what I'm doing, and that's why I set up this whole selling process, to be honest with you, to eliminate the selling process. You know, one of the best salesperson I ever had, when, she, when I first hired her, she just wanted to sell bags and belts. And she said, I will not sell vacuums. I don't want to sell. They, and that's just a fear. It's not knowing. But after she started using the vacuums and fell in love with them, she was no longer selling. She was sharing. And she was sharing to demonstrate, oh, you got to see, this is what... I mean, it, the only thing you have to be careful is they want to take shortcuts, as we all do. When somebody asks about a Dyson or an Orc, it's often, oh, yeah, they, they're terrible. They say, oh, you don't want that. This is, you really, you just, you just destroyed a cell and confidence. Why? Because your customer had enough confidence to ask you for the question, a certain amount of trust there, right? Because they wanted your opinion. And now what are you doing? <laughs> sure. They asked you about a product, you know, that they, they obviously thought was good. The commercial, have you seen that Dyson commercial? You know, $60 million buys you a lot. And I think, I'm not certain that's the amount, but that's the amount that I've heard that they're spending on their advertising campaigns. It's, it's got to work some, somewhat, you know, or they wouldn't be so successful at promoting that. So when you say it's terrible or bad, what did you just do? You, took, you basically are trying to discredit, right? Put doubt in their mind about an English speaking guy who sounds pretty impressive who invented all this cool stuff that's revolutionized the way vacuums are made, you know? Um, from their perspective, right? And you're placing your credibility against theirs. Why do that? Just show it to them. And if you don't have one, uh, if, you're not in a if you're in a vacuum store and you don't have one, I'll let, I'll let you know another little thing that I do. 
when someone calls on the phone and asks for a dice and you say and you start to badmouth, it's what I call a crash and burn sale because what you don't have sometimes you had to do that in the old days. Oh, it's, you're not really. Oh yeah, we get those in all the time. You know, they clog, they break, the wheels are falling off on the pole, and oh yeah, yeah, you don't want one of those. They may believe you, they may not. Why be in that situation? Why not be in a situation where you're going to have 100 percent success? Oh, Dysons? Yeah. Boy, we've got a huge sale on them right now. Yeah, I've got Dysons here. Are they brand new? Or am I a Dyson dealer? No. But do I have them for sale? Yeah, I do. And are they 50% off? They are. You want to know if they hang up the phone so quick they're coming down? It's a piece of cake. Am I being dishonest with them? Am I ripping them off? I'm probably saving them from a very poor decision. Or either way, if they want that Dyson, they're going to get it at 50% off. And I'll give it the same warranty as the new one. Why not? You ever read the fine print on their warranties? You know, that's why you want to be a warranty dealer. You're getting, you're getting potential sales coming in every day. You're in the perfect position. I hear so many dealers that say, I don't want to be a dirt devil dealer. I'm not going to be a Uber dealer. I'm not going to be all these dealers. They're crap. They're this, they're that. And I'm saying, why on earth would you not want to be the warranty center for a product that you know that the customer is going to be constantly unhappy with and have problems with? I, I, give, I go down to Walmart, Kmart, Chomko, and Costco and give them my car. I'll just, this, we're the repair center for them. Yeah, we'll take care of it. Have them call me. Why would I not want to take care of an unhappy customer? And given the opportunity to show them why they're vacuum, they turned it on and it's already broken. What went wrong? Oh, this is just the wrong product for your house. And to be honest with you, if it's a Chinese-made entry-level box store vacuum cleaner, well, that's, that's a large percentage of them, isn't it? What a great position to be in. Now, I want to quickly go into segue selling because I've kind of, we kind of got sidetracked with this. But the three C's, we kind of all understand, which is fun. And now what I'm going to get to is segue selling. Believe it or not, when I sell a vacuum, when someone comes in to buy a shampooer, you know what the first question I mention to them, because I've been, I, I've done so many things in my life, it's just crazy, but yeah, I've, I've been back and I'm certified for shampooing carpets and cleaning carpets. And this is what I share with them. And you guys can say, well, you know what, we're talking, we heard this expert, you don't have to say my name. But you can state me as your expert. Because when you say it yourself, people will doubt it. When you state it as from you've heard from someone else that's been in the industry as a professional carpet cleaner, then you can use them as a reference point. There's more validity. There's more power in that. You know. So the bottom line is, yeah, I, there's, this, there's this guy. You know, he actually cleans carpets professionally. And what he was telling me with this, with every cleaning, with every cleaning business, because they have to continually be certified that they go to, there's like this joke going around the shampoo carpet cleaning industry. And that is, what are the first three key components of shampooing carpet? And then they say, the first one is vacuuming. <laughs> the second one is vacuuming. The third one is, yeah. And what did I just do there? If I say it, you can doubt it. If I can get you to repeat it, you believe it. That's a subtle question that I was asking you. And you do that with yourself, you do that with the customers. You're getting them to speak and interact. Or otherwise, it's just like, you ever seen Charlie Brown? Wah, 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 wah. Oh, God killed me. Wah, wah, wah. He's coming for a bell. Wah, 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 wah. You know, I mean, they want to be out of there so fast. It's crazy. And yet, you know, my favorite little joke is, is that Samson slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. And a thousand cells every day are, are destroyed by the same means. <laughs> So, the point that I'm trying to make here is not beat us up or deprivate myself. Uh, it's just knowing what you do. You know, I'm going to make more money with less ego and a, and a good demonstration than I am with, this is my story. You came to Dagan's vacuum, so what can I do for you? I'm the owner proprietor. How, what can we do for you today? Are you being taken care of properly? Have you seen our lady? No, it just, it's, we're just so bombarded with sales. It's so much baloney and BS. And again, if you guys haven't, go through the Hilton lobby. Just walk by the perfume counters. Hi, can I help you? You know, let right your face. Let's get this. You know, and next thing you know, you're in a chair and they're putting all kinds of stuff on you. You're having fun. If you're tired, it's nice. It's silly if not to pull your wallet out. It's, it's a free facial. Are you get shampoo? I mean, it's just crazy what they'll do, but it's so much in your face. And everything's in our face. You know, I can't even go to the bathroom with buy a vacuum cleaner, you know? And, uh, you know, uh, it's just the way that it is. Although I have to admit, if you guys have a chance with those new restrooms, stay away from the Dyson urinals. They're terrible. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so the point that I'm trying to say here, Segway selling is really simple. All we're doing is we're taking our customer from one product 
and asking them a question that's in line with the question they're asking me to bring to the other. So when I, when I ask the customer a vacuum that they have, I'll say, oh, and the type of car clean that you have. What I say? Oh. You're in the, if you're in the doctor's office and you say, doc, I got a spot on my back, and he goes, oh. What? Aren't you going to respond? Aren't you going to ask something? So I'm a, that's eliciting a response from my customer with, oh. <laughs> or, oh. You know, what a, that's a pat on the back. It's just a subtle thing, you know? So if you can remember, oh, you're going to be very successful at eliciting responses from your customer in the right context. You know, when we communicate, it's not the words that we use. It's the tonality that we put behind it. Case in point, hey, I really like that hat you got there, Mike. That's a beautiful hat. Thanks. <laughs> I really like your hat there, Mike. Beautiful. Then I just say the same thing. And now here's the body language. I really like your hat, Mike. I mean, it's, it's everything, and we forget that. We get robotic. Some of us are that way. We all have different personalities. And, I right, can I help you? Would you like to hear the brochure on that product? You know, and they read it off. This is a 66,000 RPM brush roll spinning at us, made from anodized aluminum. You realize it was from anodized aluminum and titanium? Well, they couldn't afford the titanium. If it was titanium, it would be twice. You know, I mean, it's all this. When we're repairmen, it's really hard. For me, I just have to shut myself up. When I see my customer's eye glazed over, and they're saying, can I just buy it, please? Uh, you're great, but I, you know, I believe you, but you know, the first C, correct, confidence in me, not a good place to be. Uh, ultimately, if you can set up a sales presentation that incorporates all three C's, guess what you've got? A customer that's a salesperson for you, right? Seriously, that's what you will have. That's what I've experienced. Now, the Segway selling, we can go from a vacuum cleaner, correct? And we can, we can go from a shampoo sale to a vacuum cleaner, and then what do you know? I'll end up selling a vacuum cleaner and a shampooer, because if they've got a Dyson vacuum cleaner and they want to buy a shampooer, guess what the real issue is if they've got synthetic carpet? This isn't me speaking. Let them look it up, and everything that you say, verify. Have a picture of the, e, the eBay page out on unique carpeting that says, use of any Dyson product void your, on synthetic carpet void your carpet manufacturer's warranty. Something interesting to note, isn't it? Are you doing your customer a favor by selling them a are encouraging them to continue to use a Dyson product if they've got synthetic carpet, not if they've got bare floor and frail rugs and they need a surface cleaner. Cats meow. It's the best, most powerful, baggage vacuum made. It really is. And why do we like to keep the Dyson as the best and most powerful along with their paraphernalia, uh, the things that they say? What's a Dyson cost? Bagless. What's a Hoover bagless cost? What's a Dirt Devil cost? <laughs> do we really want to promote the others? I don't have to. I'm not getting paid by Hoover. I'm not getting paid by Dyson. But why not? Why go against $60 million worth of advertising? Sure, yeah. It's the most powerful. A choice. If you're going to buy, now I assume that you have all bare floor and, you know, and throw rugs and no pets. Well, I shouldn't say no pets because it does pick up surface dirt. I'll strike that line. So I assume that you have all bare floor and no throw rugs? Can we? So, oh, I'm not going to say assume. I say, so you have all throw, you all, all bare floor and throw rugs? Oh, okay. Um, well, darn, doggone it. You might have to buy something I can make you 200% margin on instead of 30%. And I was so looking forward to get rid of that Dyson because it's been around here for three years. You know, so, you know, the, the point that I'm trying to say, and I know I'm doing it jokingly, but the point is, is that we're all in business to stay in business. And if you're selling products where the, where the manufacturer is competing with you, and they're competing with you at incredibly low margins, what are they doing? Are they really, do they really have your best interest at, at heart? Sometimes we have to help them despite themselves. You know, and, and that's us to stay in business and be a repair center for them, because they certainly want that from us, don't they? You know? So that's, that's one of the things we have to do, is we have to look after ourselves and our own bottom line. Now, as far as chemicals are concerned, they're natural. Now that I've already gone from carpet to the brush roll, um, now um, carpet to uh, vacuum cleaner and shampooer, right? Mentioning how important dry cleaning is. Why? Because you heard it from the expert carpet cleaning that it's what's the first most important thing to clean carpets? Vacuum. Second? Vacuum. Third? Yeah. Vacuum. So, I mean, isn't that awesome information? So, you start them off with that first. I've honestly gone to places where they thought they needed a shampoo or a vacuum. If they could let them borrow the vacuum, there's some companies that you can borrow their vacuum cleaners, you know? <laughs> some plus these model. What an awesome deal. Well, here, just try this out. Yeah, make, and when I, do, when I use the rental system, I don't know how many of you people do, but we get lazy again. Uh, when I'm renting it out, I do a full demonstration on that vacuum. 
You realize that most of them <laughs> never bring it back? They end up buying it right then and there? Oh, mine doesn't do that. Oh, wow. I mean, it, it's just so simple. We have so many tools to be successful in the vacuum part of it. And as far as sewing machines, those of you who have sewing machines, how many of you, how many of you carry fabric? Okay, great, we do too. How many of you carry needles and accessories? Okay, not everybody can afford to have all that huge space for fabric. But I got a question for you. You're sitting at the cutting table talking to your customer cutting the fabric. The same thing with the bag and belt? They have a sewing machine, we can assume, can't we? I wonder what kind it is. How could we determine that? Oh, by the way, what kind of sewing machine do you have? The, in, whenever you ask a question, to not be confrontational and pushy, always give them the reason why. Well, the reason why I ask is we have a 10% discount on services right now. And uh, we're out of the coupons. You don't even have to print the coupons. We're out of the coupons. But I'll tell you what, I can write you up. It, it's only good for this week. You want to make it short or they're not going to use it, right? I can't tell you how many coupons I have, but I, they're outdated and don't use. But the whole purpose of that, that coupon, and you can hand write it on the receipt. Oh, here, I'll say, just bring it in. I even give my employees a dollar for every one that we get in for, for referring that, because it, it's no longer just a piece of fabric cut, now it's a service. Now we've serviced that sewing machine. Isn't that wonderful? We went from 20 or 30 bucks in fabric, or five bucks for packaging needles, because if they have a sewing machine, we're gonna ask the same questions, aren't we? And that segue sounds, so what are we gonna do? Oh, by the way, uh, when you pick it up and hand it to them, you made 75 bucks. But by the way, let's make sure this is working for you. Sound familiar? We do the same thing with the vacuum. We put it right in front of the gauge. Where is the gauge? Right in the middle of the floor. Where, what is? All the new vacuums. The ones I want to sell on one side, and Kirby, Rainbows, Electrolux, Ultraprint, Thermax, Vortex. Every vacuum company you can think of on the other side. Now, am I a Kirby, Rainbow, Electrolux, Vortex, Hyla dealer? Absolutely not. But I figure finally, being in this industry, I want to have every single thing that my, potentially that my customer can buy because I can show them and do a comparison and save them. I can be their own consumer report. I can allow them to see and touch and feel why this might not be as good as this. Is it a big investment? Most of them are just trade-ins, so not really. So the point is, is it's imperative to have your store set up where you can do that. So now I've got my sewing machine, and where do you think I'm going to put it? I'm not just going to hand it to them or take it out to the door. For quality control purposes, we want to make sure it's working properly. Ever had a sewing machine repaired, returned, because the customer didn't know what the hell they're, excuse me, didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> or made a mistake, or were in error? I have. In fact, I would say 99.9 .9 of all my returns are operator error. How do you think, what does that do to the customer's confidence if they've already picked it up and took it home and they bring it back and they're upset? What does it do to their confidence to you if there's nothing wrong with it, right? They're not going to be happy, are they? No, they're not. So I take care of it right then and there just to make sure that everything's working perfectly for you. Here, let's set it down. Where am I going to set it down at? There might be a, you know, a genome 15,000 sitting there, but depending on the machine. I'm going to set it next to whatever was comparable to that machine. Why would I do that? Because you don't want to do a huge leap, right? You want to keep it comfortable with where they're at. So I'm going to set it down to the model that's real close to them for, for two reasons. A comparison. I'm going to sew that thing off and then I'm going to ask them a question on a, a home sewing machine. I don't know what brand you carry. Uh, what brand do you carry, by the way, since you're the only one on sewing machines? What's that? Oh, you're set then. Um, this demonstration would work for you too. Uh, what I do is, I, I, by the way, do you ever do you, do you do repair on Levi's and Lean's? Do you ever have to sew through heavy material? Oh, you don't want to be sewing through heavy material. Then I, uh, I'm going to have to do this on a video. Uh, um, but the bottom line, it's called the mechanical advantage of particular brands that you mentioned that you may not or may be aware of. Uh, they allow them to go through super thick stuff and super thin stuff with a jam proof magnetic hook system that just is an amazing demonstration that you're going to see the machines fly out the door. And once you get them into that, it changes their whole level of experience in sewing because they're, no, they're no longer sewing with a 50 year old Kenmore or, you know, uh, whatever it is, Singer. Yeah, they have, they're able to cover so much more and it gets them excited and gets them to grow. I know we were talking about this last night at the sewing machine forum. How do we get the next level of sewers going? Well, if the next level of sewing of sewers are experiencing what I see being experienced in a lot of the cheap, poor quality machines that are available in the marketplace and the old ones, uh, it's a tool. And the difference between a professional and an amateur 
is that a perfect, you cannot get professional results from a poor quality tool, I don't care what it is. And, and obviously with the line that you're carrying, you're gonna be just fine. So the bottom line is Segway selling is for you to rethink about what it is that they're buying, right? And how you can, in that same vein, don't go, don't go sewing machines if you're talking vacuums. Although I'll tell you what, there's a way you can do that too, subtly. <laughs> but uh, the bottom line is you keep their mind, they came in for one thing. Anything more than that one thing, and you'll lose them. They came in to get the shampoo, they want their carpet clean, they're not happy with the condition of their carpet. So as a professional, we need to determine if it's the vacuum's problem or the shampooing. Or maybe they're just really messy, right? We don't know. And do they want a dry system or a water system? There's some dry systems that we're pretty good. It's in SIBO, Simplicity makes one of those too. Even Lindhouse makes one. So that's the key thing that's important, is that what we're able to do is match that customer's need and stay down that line the whole way through. And if you organize your store in a way that you don't have to ask the question, but just them simply looking, oh, look at this over here, the second that your customer is looking at something for more than two minutes, my rule is you can comment on it, right? Oh, isn't that cool? Have you seen that before? Oh, what do you know? This is a this is book on how to be an expert uh, cleaner by Fran Tabor. She's had over 35 years in the in the industry, and, and in fact, she's taught me everything I know. And I'll let you know one thing interesting about the chemicals and clean supplies in our store. It pays our overhead. It pays it pays all our taxes. And you know what? The cool thing about a chemical, instead of once a year, like a vacuum cell that's disposable, or once every three or four years, if it's a high quality vacuum cleaner, that the store that the customer's gonna come in the store, or maybe twice a year to pick up bags and belts, these chemicals are an amazing thing. They go right down the toilet, right down the drains. They need to be replaced weekly, some of them, monthly, some of them. And you know what? It's all part of what I do. Have you tried that? And there's a number of products that I have right at the counter that they're going to elicit response. Stuff that they've seen on TV, sound familiar? Is it stuff I'm really going to push or sell? Oh, I saw that on TV. Why wouldn't I take advantage of it? Buy that crap on TV, put it on your counter, not to sell, buy only one. But to, to debunk it, become your own consumer reports. Be, I mean, why not? Why not help the industry? Why not help your own communities and then benefit from it by getting people from being caught? You know, there's a product called Shower Off. It's, they've had it all over the radio and the TV. It's amazing. This is amazing, 1995. And if you order now, we'll double your order. All you need to do is spray it on, wait 10 minutes and spray it off. It's miraculous, it cleans, it's awesome. It's the best, it's the best um, bathroom cleaner you'll ever use. It's only 1995 for one bottle. And if you order now, we'll give you the second bottle free. This picture can handle it, which is probably as much as the bottle, right? Well, it's 1995 for what they call in the chemical industry an RTU, ready to use, right? That just means you get the bottle, you spray it out, and then you, you buy another bottle. What we sell are concentrates. So one bottle of our concentrate that would make up 396 of those 1995 bottles ready to you. By the way, did I mention that television advertising is expensive? So they have to account for those costs. So it's $19.95 for one bottle of theirs, and they can get 396 bottles, assuming they can afford the water. Uh, can you guys afford the water in a quart and just put a little bit of concentrate and make your own? If it saved you, I can't even do the math, 396 times $19, there is money in cleaning supplies. But the bigger thing is they're coming into your store instead of Walmart, Kmart, Chopco, and Costco at those cleaning supplies. Because when they're going into Walmart, Kmart, Chopco, and Costco, what are they seeing in addition to the cleaning supplies? Oh, there's a Dyson, there's an Org vacuum, there's a Hoover, there's Eureka on sale. Why not let it be your store? Make a lot of sense. So how many of you here today that aren't carrying cleaning supplies are thinking of looking into it? Raise your hand. Good, I'm glad I did that. Because I'll let you know, I didn't want anything to do with them. <laughs> in fact, we had them in Vegas. I never sold like anything. But when you utilize Segway selling and do the right products and watch the right kind of dialogue that you can have, something as simple as a stain remover, window cleaner, toilet cleaner, there's not a lot that you have to carry. Keep it simple. Give them one product that they can't buy anywhere else and be able to explain the value. That's called selling. And, and what I call selling is just simply describing the benefit. 
for their specific situation. Well, I'll tell you what, for those of you that are interested in these books, this is 35 years of research, and this will tell you actually how to sell the chemicals and the cleaning supplies. Everything I learned about this is from Fran, and she's absolutely brilliant. Um, normally, these, these books weren't real expensive. I've got two of them that were only uh, $10 each, but she had these specifically made for the show, and they're $20 each. So if you're interested in buying them, you can come up and get them. Um, and as far as any other questions, um, once you, if those who, how many of you want the books, by the way? I'm not trying, this is no sales pressure. Okay, so if you want, if you want to grab the books, we'll get the money. But then what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the floor, and what I'm going to do is show you a demonstration. Now, does the floor open at 11? Yes. yes. It does open at 11, so we're going to have a few minutes. Now, my class, what time is your class? Are you in here next? What, what time does your class start? Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Do you guys want to hear some more stuff? Any, any questions from any of you? <laughs> What's the difference in the two books? I got the brown one already. Um, this is the same as the brown book. And then she also wrote a book called Live Abundantly, Business Lessons from the Bible. Yeah. It's a book that you can, um, um, I, don't know, I don't think that, I'm not sure if that was on Amazon or not. I'd have to double check. Um, but as far as the rest of this, the rest of you are concerned, if you have any questions about any aspect of what I've discussed today, or if you want to do some more examples of Segway selling, I'll be glad to cover those for you. And thank you all for coming to the class, by the way. I need a drink of water here.